Good evening and a very warm welcome to what is the eighth in the How To Academy New York Times How To Understand Our Times series. My name is Stephen Dunbar Johnson. I work for the New York Times and it is my honor to introduce this evening's speakers who will have a very timely conversation exploring some of the world's most pressing issues and how art and creativity can impact social change and highlight abuses of fund fundamental human rights. I don't believe that there is an artist that has, has or is doing more to highlight human rights abuses and the plight of some of the world's most disadvantaged than Ai Weiwei. Well known for his outspoken criticism of the Chinese government's stance on democracy and human rights, he was detained there without charge for 81 days back in 2011. His documentary film, Human Flow, shot over a year in 23 separate countries, examines the staggering scale of the refugee crisis and it, its profoundly personal human impact. And more recently, his Omni project, which follows the impact of forced migration through the experiences of the Rohingya refugees across Myanmar and Bangladesh, are further testimony to his use his use of art to highlight human rights causes. So in conversation with Ai Weiwei this evening, we are delighted to have Ken Roth, the Executive Director of Human Rights Watch, one of the world's leading international human rights organizations, which operates in 90 countries across the globe. Ken joined Human Rights Watch in 1987 and has been at the helm for the past 17 years, helping lead, bear witness, document and bring to the world's attention human rights abuses throughout the world, helping bringing, in many instances, perpetrators to justice. And tonight, facilitating and participating in the conversation, we have Helene Cooper, my colleague at the New York Times. Helene is currently the New York Times Pentagon correspondent. Formerly, she was the paper's White House correspondent and was part of the New York Times team that won a Pulitzer Prize for its reporting of the Ebola crisis in 2017. Born in Liberia, Helene herself was a refugee, a subject she touches on in her beautifully written, searing, best-selling book, The House at Sugar Beach, In Search of a Lost African Childhood. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm welcome to Ai Weiwei, Ken Roth, and Helene Cooper. Hello, um, welcome to our discussion. Uh, I'm told by the wonderful people, wonderful people here at the How To Academy that you guys represent the intelligentsia of London. <laughs> Which, when they were telling me this on the phone, sounded a little, a little scary to tell you the truth. But I'm expecting big things from this, this audience. Uh, so I'm here tonight for a conversation with Weiwei and Ken about how creativity can address global crises, focusing particularly on migration and refugees, human rights and climate change. And my sister suggested that I kick off the discussion with a small gift for both of you. Uh, I'm originally from Liberia and there's an artist there uh, named Sam who was once a child soldier uh, during the Liberian Civil War. And ever since then, he's gone and collected bullet casings uh, from the Civil War that he just collected on the ground all over Liberia, Monrovia, and he turns them into pieces of art. So I was trying to think, I see Sam whenever I go home to Liberia, I make a point of going uh, to see him, and I have two little pieces I wanted to give both of you. I thought I would give the really nice um, palm tree to Weiwei. And because everybody in Liberia is a huge Arsenal football fan, <laughs> Ken, here's the Arsenal one. Uh, well, I'm Elena, always, I, just, I just appreciate you didn't uh, give us, you know, Mark Quinn's refugee 
item, which is blood from refugees. Yes, yeah. So um, okay. this is much nicer. Thank you. Um, be careful when you're flying back to Geneva with that on the plane, by the way. Um, I'll check my bags. <laughs> My family, we moved to the U.S. as refugees in 1980, but I do, ever since the Civil War ended, I'm often going back to Liberia, and I always make a point to look for Sam because I find his work just really inspiring, and he's, it says so much about what art can do to kind of bear witness to war, to human uh, suffering, but also to find beauty in all of this. And that's one of the reasons why I'm excited to be on this stage tonight with both of you. Um, Weiwei, let's start with you. And we're going to start with a nice, soft, comfy question. Um, how did you come to be so active in this space? I remember reading a New York Times article by Ed Wong uh, who interviewed you. He was in Beijing during the time that you were in prison, and he interviewed you along with Tom Friedman in 2012 after you were released. Uh, and he wrote that you, during your time in prison, you and one of your interrogators uh, mused about why it was that you embraced political activism. Uh, your interrogator, he wrote, had a lot of theories, maybe because you lived in New York for 11 years, uh, maybe it was because you suffered during the Cultural Revolution, or maybe it was just because of the internet. Um, have you ever managed to answer that question for yourself? It's nice to be here, and uh, it's nice this uh, is working because we have another set here. <laughs> in case this is not working well, but it's, thank you for, for this uh, very wonderful gift. I'm totally amused how people can turn something or change something, a bullet uh, shell into a piece of art, really admirable, the creativity and uh, how to work in this very difficult time and moment to, to make this, uh, make life possible. Yeah. And uh, yeah, my interrogation is only 81 days. It's not long compared to people spend a lifetime or, or over 10 or 20 years. Many, many political prisoners in China spend a lifetime. Or t they, very often they dead in, in the custody. And, uh, but uh, I, since I'm kind of survived, they let me out. Um, very often, the interrogator are wondering why you become like this. I think they raise this question uh, because they have to struggle. My father is a very hardcore revolutionary poet. And he is the one influenced generations of uh, so-called revolutionary uh, uh, liberal um, li intellectual circle writers or poet. So they, they, I think they are still trying to be rationalized to see how could his son become like this. I tell you a little story. Just two days ago, uh, on internet, someone sent me a poet, which they found out my father wrote on 1978. And uh, the poem is uh, maybe the most patriotic poem about China. Uh, everybody memorize it. Anybody ha went to school, they have to study in school till today. Huh? And uh, the, the title is, I Love This Land. It ends last two sentences, why there's always tears in my eyes because I love this land deeply. So I'm trying to write to, uh, read it to my son, who is 10 years old. i trying to say this happened in 80 years ago. And the one Japanese invaded China. Mm -hmm. And the poem, writing the same, almost same day when Japan um, army took over Wuhan, which is what happens today about this corona virus. After I read it, my son looked at me and said, how, could, how would he have a son like you? I, I couldn't answer that 
because my son thinks I'm always criticizing China, and his grandfather is so patriotic about China. And, and the, that, I think that question also in all those interrogators' mind, they have to find out, they have to really make, you know, make a, a, reason, a, a reasoning about why I become like this. I cannot answer it. You know, I, finally, they have a, a one conclusion, this is a way, way, you just watch the too many Hollywood movies. <laughs> I said, yes, that's true. I, I, I did watch a lot of Hollywood movies. They could always, you can blame everything on Hollywood. Were they asking you, when they were asking you this, um, were they interrogating you? Were they asking you in a fierce way? Or was it in a just curious, was it a conversation? Or do you feel, did you feel like you were being attacked? Um, they use all kinds of tactics, sometimes very serious. You know, they, they know what is the, vulnerable part. They tell me after 13 years being in jail, my son can never recognize me if I come out. Yeah. That kind of thing really, really make me feel deeply sad because my action simply will bring someone so vulnerable. He was like two years old mm -hmm. and uh, it will ruin his future. Yeah. That moment I feel bad, but in the most time, it's like a chat, it's like a conversation, but very intensively, because they would do study every day, then they come up with the next question, and then they use all kind of strategy. I cannot get my head around saying to you that you will not see your son again. If you, that's, that's a level, any parent can imagine that that would break somebody. Yeah, and uh, I think they are, they are telling me the truth. They said, wait, wait, you will pay for every word you have been uh, used to criticize us. You have to, you ask for freedom, right? But you have to spend all your time, minutes by minutes, second by second, for your life in this jail. So that kind of thing uh, is very deadly serious. They said, by you come out, your mom already passed away. So you, nobody will not think about this, it's not serious because it did this to many, many people. Um, I'd like to come back to a little bit more of that, but first, Ken, I just would like to, we're thrilled to have you here with us tonight. Um, and can you sort of walk us through how you got to be sitting on the stage tonight here in front of the Intelligentsia of London? <laughs> Well, my start also, in a sense, began with my father, um, who himself was a refugee from Nazi Germany. Um, he grew up in Frankfurt, and at age 12, um, he and the family were able to get out, sort of in stages, but ultimately get out um, to New York. And it, um, I grew up in Chicago, and my father would cut the hair of me and my brothers. And to keep us quiet as he was cutting our hair, he would tell us stories about his childhood in Germany. And at first, they were funny stories. He would talk about the horse that my grandfather, who was a butcher, used to deliver meat to his customers. And it was a clever horse and fast and mischievous. And then as we got older, he would tell stories about what it was like to be a young Jewish boy in Nazi Germany, afraid of being arrested, you know, being forced into a separate school. And, and so I ended up kind of growing up with Hitler stories. And that, um, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but it very much shaped me and made me realize that I, I sort of wanted to deal with this and that I wanted a profession, if possible, that would enable me to try to prevent something like this from ever happening again. Now, I should say, I, it didn't start off well for me. I'm, I'm a lawyer by training. I signed up for the one human rights course on offer at my law school each of three years, and each year it was canceled. So I graduated what with- What law school is this? It was at Yale. <laughs> so I graduated with no training whatsoever. I then went out into the job market where there were no jobs. You know, Amnesty, I think, had 20 people in it. Human Rights Watch had two. Um, I didn't have a job. So I ended up practicing as a lawyer and, and oddly as a federal prosecutor for six, seven years. 
and was volunteering kind of nights and weekends doing human rights work. And finally, a job opened up. And you know, all my friends were running off to be partners at fancy law firms, and I went to this little obscure organization that nobody had ever heard of. It wasn't even called Human Rights Watch then. Um, but it was the best thing I ever did, and I actually never left. So here I am. That's amazing. I, I love the fact that... <laughs> Um, I love what we're talking about tonight anyway, but I really love the fact that, I mean, I'm, I, I work in the Washington Bureau of the New York Times and immigration and refugees and that's just sort of, that's all people talk about right now in Washington, D.C. And that all three of us are sitting here on the stage right now, basically as immigrants, as refugees. It just says so much about a uh, conversation that I think has become missing in the United States. Um, I know we're here about to, uh, we're here to talk about how creativity um, can affect social change, but I'm also a news reporter, so um, I have to ask both of you about a big issue that's facing us right now, and that's coronavirus. What can we learn about how, and I want to ask you first, Wei Wei, what can we learn about how China has responded and handled this. And I would also like you to sort of talk a little bit as well about how the West has, has handled this as well and what this says about the relationship between China and the West. Well, this is a, a big question and a lot can, can be talked about. At the beginning, as any um, public event or incident happening in China, uh, what is lacking is transparency. And we, you never get uh, right information. And uh, basically the government is just cover up. And uh, for whatever the reason, uh, you know, you will never understand this kind of government once it's not publicly elected. And when there is no uh, freedom of press or or freedom of expression. Or accountability. Yeah, no, of course, there's no such thing as accountability. And uh, to tell the lies uh, become a uh, um, daily practice because they have this uh, very important department called the uh, Department of Propaganda, which is just fix all the um, lies to the public. And they understand this is very efficient. When I was being in, in, interrogated, they told me, they said, wait, wait, we will tell them you're, you have tax problems. I, I asked them, I said, do you think the people born in the 90s, 80s, they would believe you? Uh, you know, everybody knows I'm a political prisoner. Um, they think for a few seconds, they said, wait, wait, I tell you, 90% of people would believe us. That's what they want. They always want 90% of people or 80% of people believe, uh, believe in them. And uh, the truth is always uh, not important when 80 or 90% of people believe in them. So that works very well. So by doing that in every public crisis, they did the same. They know they're telling the lie, and you know they're lying, and they know you know they're lying. But that works very well, you know, because that's how it works. And uh, for this particular crisis, they, they managed at the beginning to, uh, to arrest eight of the doctors who first uh, put those kind of little note, chat on WeChat, be to, uh, among their families or friends to see this disease is very much like SARS because they, the doctors doesn't know what kind of disease is. It only knows that it's, uh, it can pass, uh, you know, can be spread very uncontrollable. But that's the beginning. They arrest these eight doctors and also led them to, to announce to the public on television to see uh, that's a rumor. So things like that have such broad effect to give the time, to pass the most crucial time to stop the disease. But the, rather, every level of the, the government, 
they always want to protect their own uh, their own position. The only way to do it is to not let the higher uh, level to worry about it. So, uh, so until one day they cannot uh, limit this kind of information anymore because today this uh, internet and so many people is dying and uh, a lot of people ca uh, catch the diseases. I mean, if you look at the Twitter or, or Chinese Weibo, those images are shocking. Every day people are sending out. And, uh, you know, like now the death toll is around three, 400. But every hospital is calling for the, how do you call the body bag. So they running out of the body bag. How could 300 uh, dead body running out of, uh, you know, the, the whole nation has no body bag. You know, it's uh, quite scary. And uh, of course, internationally, at the beginning, when you have this organization, WHO, WHO, I think, very, I, I, very suspiciously, why they have to say this is not uh, come to a serious degree, and also give China another 10, ten days. You know, I mean, in what favor they have to do that? So I really feel uh, completely, uh, I think either they're stupid or they're corrupted. Or they're afraid of China. I don't know, I don't know what, what I can do because China is so strong in many, many international uh, organizations. You know, they have their representative in, in many nations. They're very influential. It, it always amazes me because it's the cover up that makes it worse. Uh, instead of, I mean, how bad do you think this could get, Ken? Well, I, I mean, I think we've seen this cover up in a number of different ways. I mean, Weiwei mentioned, you know, the arrest of these H doctors in Wuhan who early on tried to call attention to the emergence of this SARS-like virus. And, you know, they were shut up. Um, the mayor of Wuhan today sort of on the one hand gave this mea culpa, yes, we should have spoken more you know, earlier, but... He then says, but of course, I didn't have permission from Beijing. You know, it's a stunning statement. Yes. You know, so basically, you know, while Xi Jinping tries to say, oh, yes, you know, I'm the emperor and everything's fine that I direct. It's just the local authorities that did something wrong. You know, the local authority in his own way is pushing back and saying, yeah, I didn't have permission, boss. You know, so we'll see how long the mayor of Wuhan lasts. But I thought it was, um, you know, it was quite brave of him to point the finger right back where it belonged. But it wasn't just the existence of the, the disease, but also, you know, they downplayed person-to-person -person transmission and, and kept saying, oh, there's no evidence of person-to-person -person transmission. It was just the wet market in Wuhan. We've shut that down. All very reassuring things at the outset that proved to be false. Um, and, you know, they may not have had the concrete evidence of the person-to-person -person transmission, but they suggested that it wasn't there, which we now know is utterly untrue. So um, that, you know, has been utterly counterproductive. It delayed by, you know, a number of days, but those days are critical. The other thing they're doing now, and, and um, Weiwei alludes to this, is that this quarantine, basically of 60 million people in Hubei Which province. Is mind boggling. I mean, this has never happened before. And you can say on the one hand, oh, isn't this great? China's responding decisively. This is what a good autocratic government can do. And then you start looking at what is happening within that. And people are not allowed to travel. You know, there's sort of a designated shopper per household. But you're hearing these stories now of people who are, you know, severely ill, and they're not allowed to get treatment until they can be tested. But they can't be tested without an appointment that they can't get. And so they're basically being left to die at home. You know, there's these two hospitals, the way we was talking about this, that, you know, the, suddenly were emerged, but it's not clear that they're hospitals as opposed to death centers. And we'll have to sort of see what happens there. But, you know, the, if you look at this from a human rights perspective, I mean, quarantine, you know, is an authorized tool, but with conditions attached that, you know, food and medical care are provided. And that's just not happening right now. So I think we have to start questioning, and the Chinese people will start questioning, you know, here's a government that has prided itself on building infrastructure. 
you know, and so the bullet trains, the new highways, the high rises every place, you know, the physical infrastructure is incredibly impre impressive. But the public health infrastructure was left to lag. And we're seeing the consequences of that today. The perfect segue to you, Weiwei, then, would be, and to bring this back around to what we're supposed to be talking about tonight, if you were approaching coronavirus and what's happening, particularly this quarantine that Ken just talked about in Wuhan, how would you, as an artist, do you have ideas for how you would tackle this? No. <laughs> Come on, we could just brainstorm right now. <laughs> You know, th there was one effort at this already, which sort of shows the reach of Chinese censorship. But um, a Danish paper put out a drawing just in the last week of, you know, the Chinese flag is a red flag with, with kind of this cluster of yellow stars around the corner. And the paper put out a red flag with a cluster of yellow coronaviruses. And needless to say, China protested, as it always does. Yes. And, and, you know, it's kind of evidence of its effort to extend its domestic censorship that Weiwei was subjected to, to extend that overseas. Well, yes, you can see a lot of, uh, not a lot, but some creativity always happens when this kind of uh, obvious disaster happens. But still, compared to the loss of human life or the property and, uh, and loss of the, the, the basic human rights, uh, you know, this is it's so painful, yeah. and uh, and I don't think any artwork can can really achieve uh, this kind of effect. Of course, artwork uh, sometimes marks the time and can be remembered. And it can shame them. Hmm? It can shame the Chinese government. Um, you mean it can shame them? Well, I don't think the sense of a shame is exist in that kind of, it's, that's what we think, that's so shameful. But I don't think they think that way. So that's why it's, you cannot find the right thing to deal with this kind of government. You mentioned, um a short while ago that when you were imprisoned, one of the things that the guards um, said to you was that you're not going to, you know, if you don't do what we want, you're not going to see your son, your two-year-old son uh, for years. Um, um, and that sort of personal, item, that personal item, um, I think not that specific item, but you, in your artwork, you do an amazing job of integrating sort of personal details to get your point across. Uh, the 14,000 Syrian life jackets, uh, for instance. Are there other places that you found where one specific personal detail can have a big impact? Well, works like this have a very big impact on me. So it's very, very, uh, I mean, impressive. I can't wait to tell Sam you yes, said that. Yes, I think, I think the creativity is like a seed and it takes time to grow. You don't, you don't, you don't just suddenly have a big tree there. Humanity takes time, takes a, a, a rain or air and to, to grow. Mm -hmm. Some, sometimes you see a huge tree there but that root has been rooted very deeply. And uh, someone 100 years ago or a few hundred years ago have put that seed or seeds landed in there. So we have to work in on humanity, just like we have to create this uh, forest. Otherwise, the, the, the planet is just uh, doesn't have any, have, you know, it doesn't have any um, plant, you know. So, and that's why we have to really defend those very basic values, um, human rights, freedom of speech, because we can easily see those conditions are very fragile. Mm -hmm. could, could I maybe pick up on that? Because wait, wait, you've um, now had to be an artist you know, under a regime that censors, and then from the outside. And I mean, I think of you know, other artists who've had to make that transition. I mean, um, one of my favorite authors is Milan Kundera, the Czech writer, who had a very hard time transitioning from writing under communism to then writing from exile in the West. 
And, you know, under communism, you've got to be more metaphorical, you've got to be symbolic, you can't say things directly, you, you have to kind of evade the censors. Um, when you're out in the West, you can say whatever you want. But have you found um, creativity, I mean, how, was, how have you navigated that, that transition? And was it easier or harder for you to be an artist in China than outside of China? Well, if they let me continue my work in China, if they don't put me in jail, then I will prefer to stay in there. Because, that's not the choice. Yeah, because uh, I, I don't simply don't have that choice. I will be put in jail, and then my voice will disappear. The jail doesn't scare me, but when I know my voice will disappear, that equals death. So that's, that's why I have to make the hard choice to, to leave China. But when you were, when you were there, because you obviously were an artist from within China for many years, what was that like compared to now being an artist in the West? I, I think in there you, you really feel there's someone in the dark corner. You don't know who they are. They try to listen to. They will be encouraged, you know, a young boy. They are waiting for, for uh, you make some kind of voice or gesture. So that's so exciting, just by that kind of simple uh, understanding. You are giving the, that possibility, that hope to someone. But in, once you're outside, of course, I have a freedom of speech. I can always talk to audience. I don't know that is relevant at all. You know, people listen to, they either don't care or they, they do care at that moment. But of course, after that, they, 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 you know, they were, the life is the same. So I don't think my voice has any meaning, uh, not as in China. But for so many years, you were protesting the Chinese government from within, which you know, many people thought that you would have been arrested long before you actually were. were you, was this sort of the, the day they you know, put you in that car? Was this sort of a day you knew was, was coming, the moment that they actually arrested you? Was it something that you expected would happen? Uh, yes and no. You, you know your testing, of course. Uh, there is a certain message you always want to be out. You always trying to think they should not arrest you only because you talk about it. You have a different opinion. And until one day they, they arrest you. So then at one moment, I was regret when they put this black hole on my face and I have to be sent into a very secret area. And I regret, why don't I have an American passport? You know, that's, that's, that's kind of cynical, but it's true. You know, I, I thought in that case, you cannot just do that to me. Mm -hmm. But that is a, a very tough question. They can do this to anybody who doesn't have an American passport. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why often the young people ask me, what should we do? I said, just, just move out, get another passport. Because I don't want them to get hurt. If I can get hurt, everybody know. Yeah. Anybody can get hurt. Because you know, with my family background, with my status, they can, they can easily just put me away. The Americans will give you a passport now. Yeah, but you know, having a Western passport. No, I don't have. I'm very stubborn. I still hold this uh, Chinese passport. You still have the Chinese passport? Yes, yes. Now, also, having a Western passport is no guarantee. There are these <laughs> two, two Canadians who have basically been held for over a year as hostages to try to release the, the Huawei it's true. CFO. It's true. I think even Canadians are shy to ask where are the, the, the other two fellows. I mean, this is obviously... a. Uh, what a joke, this two guy has to be held there and be forgotten. This, we seem to have this recurring theme of fear, of this fear, these Western organizations and Western governments feel of the Chinese, the Chinese government. It's curious. Um, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just thinking it's curious that Canada of all governments would be not raising more of a ruckus. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting, this. we, um, 
you know, getting governments to criticize China is difficult. And so I guess it was about eight months or so ago, we worked with a number of Western governments to try to get them to say something on Xinjiang, where you know, there were a million Uyghur and other Turkic Muslims who were detained for forced indoctrination. And you know, nobody wanted to do it by themselves. So we said, well, let's you know, do a joint statement. And so about two dozen governments got together and they issued a statement in Geneva at the UN Human Rights Council. But to show the fear, traditionally statements like this, somebody will then pick up the piece of paper and a diplomat will read it at the council and formally, you know, orally enter it into the record. And nobody would do that. And it wasn't until, you know, several months later when a similar group of countries issued a similar criticism at the UN General Assembly that finally actually the British government came forward and read the statement. But it shows the fear that even, you know, two dozen Western countries didn't want to risk retaliation from Beijing. Profiles and courage. Um, Ken, I was in Brussels a couple of weeks ago uh, in my hotel room getting ready to go to NATO when I heard on the BBC that you'd been detained in trying to get into Hong Kong uh, to deliver that human rights report. Take us with you on your flight, your arrival. Paint the story for me. Because, I mean, it's, it's kind of cool to be able to say you got detained. Well, de detained is a bit of an overstatement. But I, you know, Human Rights Watch typically puts out reports on, you know, one country or one issue at a time. But once a year, we put out a global report. We call that a world report which covers you know, a kind of quick synopsis of 90 countries. And then I traditionally write an introduction about an important global issue. And this year I decided to highlight the threat that the Chinese government poses to human rights, the way it is trying to extend its domestic censorship overseas, and the way it's been attacking particularly the UN and multilateral institutions that try to enforce human rights. So that was gonna be the big thesis and the logical place to release it. We always try to choose a relevant place. It would have been best Beijing, that wasn't in the cards, so we chose Hong Kong. And you know, Hong Kong should have been no big deal. I had done a press conference in Hong Kong less than two years earlier, releasing a Human Rights Watch report on gender discrimination in the Chinese job market, completely uneventful, you know, easy, no problem. But I flew in after you know, 16 hours on my Cathay Pacific flight from New York and um, went up to the immigration officer and my name popped up on the computer and he immediately filled out a form that said restricted across the top and they ushered me into a side room. And so for the next four hours, I mean, I wasn't detained. I had three immigration guards who all treated me very nicely. And this um, young woman who was my interrogator who asked the most perfunctory questions and they clearly were just waiting for a decision from someplace. Um, I asked, you know, oh, who's making this decision? You know, Hong Kong or Beijing, somewhat naively. Um, and she insisted it would be Hong Kong, and I, of course, knew that wasn't the case. But after um, a couple hours, they said, we've decided to bar you. So I said, could you please explain why? And she said, immigration reasons. Did you still have your cell phone? Had you told people at that I, point? I had Did my, they let you keep it? No, I like, let me keep the cell phone. The problem was, because I knew that there was a risk of, of you know, that they would seize my phone and take everything from it, I had a dummy phone. You know, I had a, and it was, it was connecting to the Wi-Fi in the terminal, but it wasn't connecting to the phone service. And so when they finally barred me and they put me back on the next Cathay Pacific flight back to New York, so I spent basically this weekend, you know, 32 hours flying in coach back and forth, you know. Um, coach. But, but the, the, the funny thing, taking a page from Weiwei, I mean, I kind of, you know, have good mentors here. I decided I would do a selfie video before I got put back on the plane. And so as they're kind of ushering me back to the flight, I was the last person to get on the flight. They were holding the flight. They were pushing me along. You weren't refusing to get on the flight? No, no, no. Well, you I could did, have hammed it up a little I, bit. I did say, I'm not getting on that flight unless you give me an aisle seat. <laughs> Which they did. You know? I should have said, give me business class. I didn't do that. You know? But as, as, as I'm on the gateway, I say, I want a moment of privacy. And I said it very firmly. And they said, okay, and they backed off. So that, at that point, I pulled out my phone and I did the one minute selfie. Um, and that was easy enough. But then they're like, you know, walking me down the gateway and I see that I'm losing the Wi-Fi signal. And I, you know, it's like sort of one of these James Bond films, you know, where you, you see the, I'm trying to send it off, you know, 
and it's the, the thing is moving along and it's not quite getting to the end and they're saying hurry up hurry up the plane's got to leave and the thing is going really really slowly and i knew if it doesn't send by the time i get on the plane it's over with and it finally looked like it had sent but i couldn't even tell for sure i you know i had to ask i got on the plane and texted my assistant and said did you get it and she said yes finally so so that's you know stupid little one minute selfie video has now been seen by 430,000 people and you know that's, yeah. a, that's amazing and it, it then, you know, it triggered... What, and everybody wants to see the report now. Well, exactly. So it was, you know, massive media attention for this report that I went back to New York and released at a press conference at the UN two days later. So it was like a huge press, you know, release for the report. Mm -hmm. And then, um, it, you know, ultimately the reason for the being barred became clearer. At first, um, the, the day after Beijing announced I was blocked because I was, you know, inciting the Hong Kong protesters. And you know, my reaction to this was at first, like, well, you know, please, they don't need me to tell them to stand up for democracy and the rule of law. But also, you know, if, if, you know, if I have the power to mobilize a million people on the streets of Hong Kong, you know, that's, <laughs> I wish. Um, but ultimately, at the press conference in New York, a Chinese diplomat showed up. And they, they never speak to the journalists. But the guy showed up at the press conference, so we handed him a microphone. And he said, um, Two things. One is that I was not giving enough credit to China for the human rights progress it had made. And, you know, so I asked him, well, which progress is that? Is it, you know, the million detainees in Xinjiang? Is it the surveillance state? Is it the crushing of Hong Kong democracy movement? Whatever. But then he said, in any event, you were going to say what you just said here. That's why we blocked you. <laughs> so, you know, finally the... <laughs> True I, love, came I love the classic backfiring of that. I mean, they couldn't have played into your hands better. Um, Michael Shear and Julie Davis in the New York Times Washington Bureau came out with their book on Trump and immigration a few months ago, Border War, Wars. And in the excerpt that ran in the New York Times, um, they, it was very, it was, they're talking about Trump suggesting that they put alligators in a moat outside the Mexico wall and all this crazy stuff. And Trump went nuts and started tweeting about, these are lies, these are lies. And their book sales went rocketing to the roof. So um, for both of you, I'd like to ask, and wait, wait, I'll ask you first. Do you think creativity and art has made any significant difference to political problems in China? My answer would be very disappointing. I would say no, oh. uh, even, uh, but depends how you measure it. Mm -hmm. um, I often say it's like a dark room. If you have one little hole there, people will see the light yeah. so strong, you know, so people would remember that. And uh, in China, it's a situation like that. That's why I'm so enjoyed, you know, when he just described, uh, yeah. you know, when he made that video, that was the most significant it's time. It's a tiny moment. You know, that, it, yeah. but I, when I was beaten in, in one hospital, uh, hotel mm -hmm. in the middle of night, okay. three o'clock, when I trying to search for the, the death of the student. Police come like three o'clock in the morning, kick down the door and beat me. That uh, caused me like hemorrhage later. Mm -hmm. So but that moment I, I took one photo and I post on the internet. Mm -hmm. I have the same kind of excitement. You cannot cover that kind of truth. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, if you put that uh, like one minute earlier or one hour earlier, it will be so dramatically taken because everybody feel they're in the same condition. Mm -hmm. If you pay, put two days later, not so many people is mm -hmm. going to be care. So I constantly get myself involved with this kind of understanding mm -hmm. and uh, did many, many works like that of an image or, or a little video, a few million people watch it. And uh, even when they uh, put so many civilian cameras among the, my house, I set up a camera to live broadcasting my 
yeah. my daily yeah. life for 24 hours a day. I said, if that's what they want to really know what I'm doing, mm -hmm. I put uh, this camera right above my uh, bed. The image is pretty disgusting because you don't, you forget. Yeah, you, know. you, you forgot it was Yes, there. of course. <laughs> but uh, the, the, on the internet, people, every, they grab your, your whatever the position, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the image. They, they send back to me next morning. It's, I was very ashamed. But the, the police, uh, after 70 hours, they called me. They're the way way. They're begging me, said, shut off that uh, live stream. <laughs> I said, is that what you want? You know, is, you, know why you, you put so many cameras around me, but you never know. I don't even know. They, they may have cameras in my bedroom, but they don't want the other people to share people the same information. So if you can call that as an act, act, uh, art activity, I'm the master. Of course. But it also... Uh, it, you know, I, I, have a, I have such a celebrated life under that kind of condition. And uh, day by day, you know, it's only, uh, I, I'm, it's, like I'm, uh, it's like I'm taking drugs. You know, I'm uh -huh. always in very high uh, stage. It takes a special level of confidence to put a camera in your bedroom on the ceiling and live stream it to the world. Yeah, it's, it's like a push. Who can tell the truth? Yeah. You know, so I never believe they can challenge with me. I'm always ready to challenge with anyone. So if you have that kind of mental uh, stage, mm -hmm. uh, it's exciting. If I could follow up on this, because one thing that I, th I think going back to the, the earthquake where you did work on, in Sichuan, was that it? Where, yes. Um, where, you know, it was uh, horrible. I mean, it, these, these schools that collapsed, um, killing many children. But, uh, you know, that strikes me as illustrative of the work that you've done to try to, you know, break this aura of this government that is looking out for the welfare of the people and is rapidly advancing China. And in fact, what you see is that there are all these shortcuts and, and a real lack of concern for the individual. And it's always struck me that your work, you know, you find creative ways to illustrate that. But I, I think, and, and there may be examples with the coronavirus as well, but as I look at it from the outside, I think that's one of the greatest challenges because um, many people just say, oh, you know, they've pulled hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, things seem to be going great. And they forget about the individual and they forget about the, um, the willingness to sacrifice the individual. You know, not just leave people behind, but really shoot people up in order to get to, you know, the kind of macro goals and foremost to, to stay in power. And my sense is your art is, you've always found creative ways to illustrate that discrepancy between the, the glowing public image and the somewhat uglier reality. Well, it, it takes an individual to act. You know, we all understand the situation, but a few people can act out. And the truth needs to be, you have to prove you're going through that kind of difficult matter to find out each individual's name. So the state, of course, covered those names. They said, this is a national secret. I said, okay. If you don't announce it, I will do investigation. So I, you know, I was very quickly respond to it. So the till we find the last name, you can never stop me. You know, with that kind of intention, we has been arrested around three three thousand times. You know, police arrest those people, but they cannot really put them in jail. They just trying to find out the names of the students, so they. They, they lock you up, then they let you all go, then we go to there again. Mm -hmm. So eventually we found of 5,219 names with their birthday and uh, which family they belong to and which school class they, when they, they, they passed away. So that uh, moment is so, uh, it's like a miracle. It happens on the internet. Every day, are posting the new names. But that time, China 
the government still haven't learned how to really censor the internet. They just delete it. But before they delete it, many people already uh, repaste it or copy it. So every day, it's, uh, everybody watch my blog because this crazy guy is an artist. He just bears the whole responsibility to give out all those names. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think those kind of things can be very powerful if that can really happen till my, my blog being totally shut off. Mm -hmm. You know, my name cannot never appear on the Chinese internet anymore. I, I'm wondering though if we may be entering a slightly different phase because, I mean, if you think about China, they had the Great Firewall, which was designed to prevent the Chinese people from um, accessing the web, you know, getting information from the rest of the world. But then social media arose. And social media for a while had great promise in China. Um, the government hadn't figured out how to control it. And so the Chinese people were talking to each other, which was revolutionary. Um, now they've you know, put in enough person power and enough you know, artificial intelligence that they do seem to largely control social media. Except you know, people are reporting now that discussions about Wuhan and about the coronavirus are being permitted with a bit more liberality than had been the case. And I'm wondering, why do you think they're doing that? You know, do they feel they need to let the steam out? Or, or what's going on? I think it's a game between a state power and the individual. China not only have uh, the most sophisticated uh, uh, facial recognition or internet uh, uh, police. Uh, and during this uh, corona uh, virus, they even use drones to, to follow individuals uh, on the very remote area to tell them, you know, say, just go home, mm -hmm. wear your uh, face ma uh, mask. You know, I, you see those images of an old lady walking into a very remote area, the drone just flying uh, above her to tell her, just go home. You know, you see those things are only you can imagine in novel or in the film, but this is the reality. And uh, they know everything of every uh, household. And uh, they, can, they can design all kind of way to control them. They not only know you, they know your relatives. They know you care about your job and they know uh, your friends who, 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 what they're talking about. So this is very uh, scary, but that kind of model already being uh, successfully created. And also they are export this kind of model to many other nations. Um, your latest project is Omni. Uh, and if you guys haven't seen it, it's, it's fantastic. It's delving into the Rohingya crisis. Uh, through these refugee camps that you visit. Uh, what I loved about Omni is how long you stay in the moment, which allows you to convey the monotony of refugee camp life. As a journalist, I've spent, I've been to many, many refugee camps. Uh, I remember just recently, I was in one in Northern Cameroon. It was a Boko Haram refugee camp and this one particularly stays with me because I had very little time. I had about 10 hours. And I did the classic journalist route where I sort of parachuted in and sucked up all of my interviews with as many people I could, as I could about how they had fled Nigeria and how Boko Haram had attacked their villages and all of this. And I got all of my interviews and, and then I left and went back. Uh, went back south. And I remember at the end of that day, I felt horrible. I felt like I was a vampire. I'd gone in and I'd sucked up all of these stories of trage tragedy from people who were clearly traumatized. And I didn't feel good about myself. I had a short amount of time. And when I was watching Omni, what struck me is how much time you spend just in the everyday the everyday monotony of being in a refugee camp, the people who are standing in line waiting for their food package, and you just stay there 
on this one road, and there are all these people standing in line, they're waiting to get their food packages, and you're there just, and you can see, you can see both the trauma in their faces, but you can see just the, this drudgery of this life that they now have in this refugee camp. Can you talk a little bit, I mean, did you go into it thinking I'm gonna just stay in the moment, I'm just gonna show people what it's like just to live day in and day out in this sort of static existence? Uh, I, I think you, you point out a very important uh, uh, thing as one journalist or someone uh, have a, some kind of assignment has to go to somewhere to write a story. Um, and know what you said is you feel very sad because you're, you're just occasionally yeah. be part of it. Then after that, it's by. So that, that's very normal, it happens to anybody. Mm -hmm. And that's why I have to sign myself into a very difficult assignment because I'm an artist. And I have to tell myself this is difficult enough, so I have to spend a lot of time. And when we start filming the refugee situation, uh, human flow, I realized we have to travel to over 20 nations and visit around the 40 biggest refugee camps. Each time it's very short, it's not very, it's not long enough, but we have to try to uh, create our filming or the frame and the take time, you know, to, to make sure we can capture some sensitivity of people being there, not just for days and months, Average refugees will maintain the refugee status as 25 years. So this, you know, this is a, um, this is a this crazy. Is their life. Life or generations could be. If you're a young boy, you're totally finished. There's no school. And uh, if you're adults, you also completely feel such a failure, you cannot find a job. And of course, not to talk about elderly people you will die there. And uh, the world, sometimes, they pay little attention, yeah. you know, because basically, you are the waste of humanity. You know, you're, you're just wasted. The people come to you as the wasted. 70 million people, as officially, as uh, refugees now. And uh, so, I, very often, I have to put myself in a difficult assignment, so I have to tell my colleagues we have to shoot this way, we have to be patient, so they have to wait their day and the night to achieve some kind of image. For what? I mean, you know. So that image only trying to give some integrity to the subject matter, you know, the story. That's what, that's what really amazed me so much about Omni is that it's the exact opposite of what we do. We go in there looking for the story that brought the people there, and now they're, they've got refuge, and you're going in there looking at the horror of what their life has now become. Yeah, it's very, it's very uh, often we're trying to uh, make the story which can, can be a story. That's a problem mm -hmm. because we, we, the narrative is very much trying to cope with our intelligence and our way of understanding. But the reality, the tragic means it doesn't really follow our logic and doesn't really uh, reflect our intelligence. Yeah. I mean, I think this is, we obviously represent three different but related disciplines here. You know, but as an artist, as a journalist, as a human rights activist, in each case, you want to tell stories. Um, you need to tell stories because the only way to make people comprehend or enable them to comprehend some of these horrors is through the individual. You know, statistics, large numbers are irrelevant. Um, but there is this extractive dimension to this problem of collecting stories because what's in it for the storyteller? And you know, when you when you deal with refugees, I mean, the Rohingya in Bangladesh, 
yes, you can maybe make some difference for them in terms of improving their conditions. So, you know, Bangladesh just announced that it would begin to permit um, formal education for some of the kids, which they had been blocking because they didn't want to make this population permanent. So there is, you know, some value in terms of just improving conditions for refugee life. But where you really feel extractive is when you talk to the refugees about, you know, what happened back in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. You know, tell me about the atrocities that you just fled. You know, the murder, the rape, the arson. And there, you know, you're not really able to do anything for these people who suffered so much. So at most you can, you know, maybe help to bring to justice the perpetrators. And, you know, Gambia just brought this case before the International Court of Justice, a genocide case, which was unprecedented, but is a, a step toward some accountability. The International Criminal Court is now in Bangladesh interviewing people. So there may be some hope there. I think in many ways the most important thing that people who have fled are able to do is to help protect their brethren back in Myanmar. Because we tend to forget about those people. There are 730,000 Rohingya who fled you know, a little over two years ago with this you know, awful campaign of ethnic cleansing. But there are 600,000 Rohingya who are still in Myanmar. You know, basically living in these enclosed camps or encircled villages, terrified, you know, unable to travel, threatened with violence if they move outside these little perimeters. And, you know, getting these stories out does impede the Myanmar army from continuing as violently to persecute these people, even though they're living this apartheid-like existence where they're just, you know, stuck in these areas, unable to lead a normal life. But at least there is a small degree of protection that comes from hearing the stories of what happened two years ago in protecting people tomorrow. Except now after looking at Omni, I feel like I should be going back and just writing about life now for these people. Um, we have a little bit of time left uh, to take questions. Uh, and so if you have um, a question uh, for any of the three of us, but I'm sure it's going to be <laughs> directed more toward Weiwei. Uh, please come forward. We have microphones um, right there. Uh, and so raise your hand if you have a question. And I'll call on you. I see somebody right, it's kind of hard to see, but right straight in front of me raising. Uh, you can, can you come forward to the microphone? And while you're making your way to the microphone, in fact, if you have questions, just come forward to the microphone. While you're making your way to the microphone, I have a quick one for either one of you, since we're on this topic of the Rohingya, Rohingyas. What happened to Aung San Suu Kyi? Ken? <laughs> yeah. But look, at, but just to sum up Aung San Suu Kyi, we confused a human rights victim with a human rights defender. Yeah. You know, she undoubtedly was a human rights victim. Um, we helped her get out of house arrest. But her interest in this was to pursue a political career. And she's the first to say she's a politician, not a human rights activist. And it is not, you know, she does not perceive it to be in her interest, particularly to defend the Rohingya, who are probably the most despised minority in the world. And they are so unpopular in Myanmar that she sees no political advantage to coming to their defense. And uh, you know, as we all know, went so far as to lead the defense of the army against the genocide charges in The Hague. So, you know, this is, it's such a disappointment. I used to have a big um, poster of Aung San Suu Kyi in my office and I, you know, I, I took it down. I, it, it's just shameful what's happened to her. Sir? Ai Xianxiang, Huan Yin Yi, Lai London. One of the most poignant uh, exhibits I saw of yours was that of a tiger in a pit taken from a zoo in Gaza. And I saw that exhibit in Jerusalem. And I would like to know, how can we reconcile democracy with oppression? <laughs> An easy one for you. Well, uh, first I'm impressed you noticed that little video clip. Um, you know, that's a tiger in Gaza Zoo. Um, almost, uh, it suffered, it's almost uh, dead, but later being uh, uh, risked by four pounds. But before, um, 
Before that, I insist on filming it. But uh, they all in this kind of cage, which you can never really film it nicely because it's so so dirty and sad and small. Of course, that's part of a reality, but I don't like that reality. I said we have to let the tiger out. So the only way to let it out is to dig a big, uh, how do you say, the, like a, a hole on, uh, on the ground. So the tiger can suddenly jump out of the, the cage to have a, a very small, uh, uh, limited space to, to run around. And uh, immediately, uh, after a few circle, the, the tiger uh, fought with very big noise. Huh? Mm -hmm. And uh, during the editing, my film editor trying to take off that voice, uh, I said, no, 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 no. So we, we still have that noise in, in the film. And uh, that reflects uh, the, the worst condition a uh, human can do to another life. Of course, we can see the Gaza, people in Gaza, uh, basically living like that tiger. And uh, you know, that's how we, I think we, we make so-called art which uh, I create some kind of thing. someone can notice. I'm, I'm happy you noticed about it. Yeah, maybe just to respond you. to your, your philosophic um, question though. I mean, obviously, you know, Israel is a domestic democracy, but the people in Gaza don't get to vote. So, you know, it, there's nothing to stop a democracy from imposing repression on someone else. And even, you know, the problem of autocratic populism today is we found that um, you know, demonizing and persecuting a minority can be popular. And so we've, I think we have to distinguish between elections, you know, majoritarianism and democracy. You know, democracy includes not just an election, but also respect for rights and the rule of law. And the Trumps or the Orbans of the world um, get elected, but they then undermine democracy by trying to, you know, attack um, unpopular minorities as a way of maintaining their popularity. Um, hi there, great uh, discussion. Um, this is both for Waiwai and Ken. You both have been active in art and in activism for decades. How has your storytelling and your creativity changed over the years and how do you think it needs to change to make the rest of the world care and take action? I, that's a question actually I have to ask myself all the time. It's, uh, in China we have an old saying to say, you face in the wall for 10 years, just trying to find the second that wall collapse. And uh, it's very much like meditating, but the wall may never collapse. And, uh, but since we only have like one life, we have to say what our life is for. So I think this is really a, a question about how we look at ourselves. I mean, we've, we've had to, um, you know, the world changes, obviously, and you can't do the same thing over and over. And, you know, we found that we have had to be quite creative in what we do to sort of be effective. And so, you know, with fact-finding, I mean, governments now try to block us, so we increasingly use satellite imagery and open source investigation and ways to kind of peer over borders, even if governments block us. You know, with, with our communications effort, you know, like Weiwei, we use video, we use photographs, we use ex social media extensively to get word out. And even with advocacy, we've had to be creative. You know, we can't go to the U.S. government and ask it to promote human rights. I mean, that's silly under Trump. So you have to create, you know, sort of new coalitions, whether it's the, the Lima group of Latin American democracies to focus on Venezuela or the Organization of Islamic Cooperation to focus on the Rohingya. Um, you just have to try kind of new creative routes and always kind of probe to see, you know, how do you make a difference? How do you build up enough pressure to move governments to, to respect rights? 
Yes, sir. And you mentioned the massive popularity of Arsenal in Liberia. And um, you're probably aware that Mesut Ozil protested against the treatment of the Uyghurs, um, one of the Arsenal's most sort of famous and popular players. Instantly, that is amazing that you were just able to bring that around <laughs> to the Uyghurs, by the way. Well, instantly China cancelled the next uh, television, uh, te televised Arsenal game. Which was great for the Arsenal fans in China because we lost to Manchester United City. <laughs> um, but my, my, my serious point is to what extent can individual actions by p potentially sports people influence how China views the treatment of the Uyghur minority and, and others? I think that's perfect for you, Ken. All right. I mean, I, I think it's incredibly important, and maybe the best way to test that is by China's reaction. Um, I mean, what they did with Arsenal was actually small compared to what they did to the National Basketball Association. You know, here you had some, you know, some guy in Houston who tweets support for the Hong Kong protesters, and China threatened a billion-dollar television contract with the NBA. It shows, you know, how much they're trying to censor the rest of the world. And there are, you know, is case after case of, you know, Cathay Pacific being forced to, you know, stop their employees from supporting the protesters or, you know, Daimler, you know, Mercedes-Benz having to apologize because some social media person, you know, put a, um, said something positive about Tibet or, or even, you know, Tom Cruise and Top Gun, the sequel, has now the Taiwan flag removed from his um, leather vest. You know, so there are these little things but China cares about this and is trying to use its economic might to stop statements around the world that it doesn't want. Um, but it shows that it is very, you know, you're, you're touching a raw nerve and particularly the treatment of the Uyghurs. They've gone to extraordinary measures, including setting up show tours and lying through their teeth and doing all kinds of things to try to deny the reality, which is they're trying to force a million Muslims to abandon Islam and to abandon their culture and become, you know, worshiping members of the Communist Party and Xi Jinping. So the only way to fight back about this is for people who have a voice. And the Arsenal player was an important voice, particularly with Turkey, which, which matters. You know, so um, I think we have to keep at this and we have to find more people who are willing to accept the, you know, the predictable retaliation from China and say it anyway. And there's safety in numbers, you know, just as the Western democracies learned that if they speak together, China can't cut off economic relations with all of them. You know, so it's important for groups of celebrities, groups of companies, you know, trade associations and the like to find that safety in numbers. And, um, you know, China likes dealing with companies or countries one at a time. But when a group bands together, they don't retaliate. They, they, they can't afford to cut off relations with everybody. And that's, you know, that's the path forward. But do you think, Ken, that these individual actions make a difference? I think it makes, I mean, everybody knows about this Arsenal case. Everybody knows about the NBA. And, you know, most people, I mean, still, I think the plight of the Uyghurs is breaking through, you know, into public attention. But even there, you know, people aren't quite sure. And, you know, this is the problem with China. It's so big, it's so vast, but yet so closed that it's a struggle to figure out, you know, how do you portray this, not in some abstract way which passes people over, but in the kind of human way that Ai Weiwei is able to do. I think it works. And uh, of course, take many, many drops to become a rain. So I, I really encourage everybody does it and apologize later, you know, become a movement of uh, apologizing. So then that will work or don't apologize, you know, proudly assert it and yes. just go forward. But no, I look at China is extraordinarily sensitive to this. The reason it tries to retaliate is because it knows that, you know, this kind of public protest undermines this image it's trying to portray of this, you know, benevolent dictatorship that's doing a better job of ushering China into the modern era than this messy democracy out there in the West. But the problem is, you know, problematic as democracy is, we know this with Brexit and everything else here, you know, nonetheless, when you have autocrats they inevitably serve themselves before the people. And, you know, China goes to great lengths to cover that up, but it takes artists and journalists and human rights activists to show that reality. And the more people who understand that reality, the fewer who endorse this kind of autocratic rule that Xi Jinping represents. 
Uh, but not corporations. I mean, I think it's interesting that Weiwei said apologize later, and you mean apologize to sort of the corp corporations that get angry at the individuals. For, for instance, Arsenal got angry at Mesut Ozil for what he did. Um, they seem to be not the... I, I think to ask people to apologize is like ask them to emphasize the same point twice. <laughs> I think it's really stupid if somebody says something you said you have to apologize. That can only show the stupidity. I'm sorry for saying the truth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, hi. Um, well, coming from Russia, I suppose I have to draw parallels with what's going on in my country, um, the demise or the lack of human rights, and also being a representative of an um, ethnic minority, um, it's, it's actually quite scary and painful to see what's happening to some of them in Russia. Um, what I which, see, which one? Um, I'm, I'm a Buryat. Um, what I see amongst um, uh, people from Russia and some artists, performers and activists coming from Russia is um, a lack of hope that their voice will ever be heard in the, in the West, I mean, let alone their own country. Um, I mean, not only are they facing, um, you know, the news like coronavirus, um, the news like Brexit, but they're also facing, um, you know, people's attention being drawn away by Instagram, Love Island, what's not. Um, so the question is to Ai Weiwei, um, you as an artist with a voice and a platform who's well known, but what would be your recommendation to those young or not so young activists and performers and creators to continue seeking an outlet or finding the way to reach um, maybe people in the West, not only people in the West, I mean around the world and keep on talking about their own concerns and plies? Well, it's, uh, it's very hard to give advice it's like uh, uh, what they should buy in the supermarket. I, I think you have to be very sincere to say that's your life. And, uh, you know, if you're not sincere, and it's, that means it's not uh, even necessary. So I think uh, Lenin said, uh, you know, you cannot organize a revolution. Revolution comes by itself. So I don't know either, I, I cannot tell by Russian, maybe the situation isn't bad enough or people can uh, really still can tolerate the, the condition. Uh, and I think it's very often if I have to analyze why I have to react in many ways, I think at first I'm, I'm very fragile. I am very sensitive or nervous about the condition. And uh, the, I respond with a uh, kind of careless situation. So that uh, maybe people give credit about those situations because everybody in the same, can sense the same kind of condition. Yeah, I mean, I also, to, to put a bit of a positive note on this, I mean, I think there has been, you know, a, a pro-right surge in many respects over the last year. You know, we've seen longtime dictators overthrown in Sudan and Algeria. We saw, you know, Orban in Hungary and, and Erdogan in Turkey losing big time, a whole series of, of important local elections, you know, losing Istanbul, losing Budapest. Um, in Russia, you know, there were these local elections in Moscow, which Putin, first of all, you know, could only pretend to win by disqualifying all the opposition candidates who had any popularity. And then the opposition gamed the system anyhow and, and kind of repudiated Putin's preferred candidates. So, you know, you have a government that's running scared of its people and is doing everything it can to try to limit protests, to control the electoral process. But this is not the way a government acts as if it's proud of what it's delivering to its people. This is the way government acts when it, it knows that when push comes to shove, it's just defending itself, that people are seeing through this and that they're losing the ability, even though they control the media, even though there's this you know, monopoly of information for most people, even there, they're kind of losing what popularity they had. So I kind of look at the events of the last year in Russia in, in more positive terms. And you know, who knows how quickly this moves, but it's clear that many Russians have seen through the Putin facade and don't like what they see. So we have three minutes left. So I'm going to be the enforcer. Um, why don't the three ladies in front each ask one quick question, one after the other, and we'll be very fast with our answers. Sure. Hi. 
Wei Wei, I hope you remember me from our music video in Beijing. Oh, yes. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering just something that we've touched on already this evening in terms of the way that the media is being controlled in newer ways these days, especially, for example, coming from America, people being told that the things that they're reading may or may not be fake news, potentially having to think about educating young people in schools about how to even know whether what they're reading is true or not. And I mean, that's something that's been present in many countries, especially China for a while, and now it's spreading to the biggest Western country. So I was just wondering all three of your opinions on that and how maybe we can help young people learn to see the truth. Okay, thank you. Next. Hi, uh, hi Wei Wei. I'm a young documentary filmmaker. Um, if those school children died in Wenchuan, in Wenchuan earthquake were alive, they, might, they would at my age now. So um, I'm wondering uh, if most of Chinese people, they don't care about democracy and uh, human rights. They only care about their lives. So why do you still insist on it? That's also confused for me. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I would like to ask actually quite a very simple question. Um, I do fashion and fashion has been a very powerful tool to tell a story and that's what inspired me to take on fashion. Um, but sometimes to tell the truth is kind of scary. So I want to know in your career, in your early career, did you ever feel scared to take that bold move um, of telling the truth? And what did you tell yourself in those moments? Thank you. Thanks. Last one. Hello, I'd like to say hello to all of you. Um, I'm from Puerto Rico, and Puerto Rico is a huge humanitarian issue. One of the questions is, I know about the human rights, I'm a film producer, one of the human rights issues is usually international. I want to question that domestically. And I, Wei Wei, you are invited to Puerto Rico. I come from a group of artists who were locked up up to 55 years for sedition. Most of them made 10 years in jail and came out with cancer. My question is, how are human rights being addressed um, locally in domestic, you know, in, in, in the States uh, and in England as well? I've been here for 18 years. I landed two days before 911, went back to America, helped put together the Tribeca Film Festival. Okay. So, you know, resilience is in our blood naturally as artists as well. So. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we're going to do the speed round. Um, I'll take the first one, media. Uh, I think we're in uncharted territory uh, when you look at sort of this, this new fake news and the whole idea that you can't believe what you read. Um, and the advice I would give to everybody is look at the source. Uh, that's the most important thing that you can do for yourself as a consumer of news is to make sure you're looking at where you're getting your news from, because there are a lot of outlets with uh, all over the place that are maybe not as credible as you might like, but you know the ones that are credible. Uh, the second question was about the earthquake. You want to take that? Earthquake is way away. Yeah. Well, um, nice dodge. Yes, uh, I, I would also sometimes ask the same question, but it's all about her compassion. And when you realize those children never comes back home, when you realize they could be your sisters or brothers, and uh, you would, there's no other um, argument. I think this has become a responsibility to to ask why my cats today tonight's not come home. You know, it's just a cat, or how can he survive? with this kind of traffic, and who is going to take that cat? I mean, not to talk about human life. So I think this is really a very central question about life and about asking for truth. Thank you. Uh, there was, I have number three is fashion, and then I didn't write anything after that. Do you remember the question? Well, I think, I mean, the fashion was also a bit about the truth. I mean, I, I think the truth is the key to accountability. 
And the reason why you know, people like Trump like to talk about fake news is that if there is no more truth, then there's no more accountability. Then governments can do whatever they want. And so I think the challenge for all of us is to figure out ways to demonstrate the truth when you know, there's this deliberate effort to undermine its very existence. And I mean, Helene, you're right, part of it is you know, certain institutions develop a reputation. The New York Times, Human Rights Watch, I hope, are understood as places that you can rely on. But a lot of it really does come down to you know, what Weiwei does, which is you know, portraying individuals. Mm -hmm. and, and there is something about you know, the personal narrative, the personal story, that um, speaks the truth that abstractions don't, and which even those who want to just dismiss it all as fake news can't really get rid of because there's a person who's saying this. And so I think that you know, this is our challenge is to you know, bring those individual stories forward and then you know, draw conclusions from that. But we have to do that because you know, the other side has figured out the power of the truth and they are pushing to you know, move to a factless world when they can then do whatever they want. Um, the last question was about uh, local, how you can address human rights issues from a local level. I, I think it takes a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, individuals to defend. There's no other way. Because you know the situation better, you feel much real and stronger than anybody else. There's no textbook or any kind of teaching can teach you this kind of deep feelings. So there's no other way out. That's why human rights story is always a sad story. It's never a, a great human rights story. It's always a sad story. Well, no, I, I see there I disagree because there are victories. You know, there are times when things get better. And so, yes, it's built on a bunch of sad stories, but there are times when you have change. And I mean, I think about why do I keep doing this? You know, I've been doing this for a while. Um, it's not just to kind of, you know, get immersed in the misery of what people go through, but it's to take those stories and, and move things forward. I mean, go to the Rohingya, um, you know, they've been through horror, but, um, you know, the, the pressure is making it more likely that Myanmar ultimately is going to let them back. And it's not going to, as you say, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but that's the only way to move governments. And we've seen, you know, the big changes that have taken place in various parts of the world over the years. You know, take, take Eastern Europe. You know, it used to be a bunch of Soviet, you know, bloc dictators. And now you've got democracies. You know, there were much of East Asia and Southeast Asia that you've seen big change. Much of Southern Africa, much of Latin America. I mean, there are parts of the world where we've seen real improvements. Um, so we have to focus on the parts like China that remain um, obstinate and, and, and are filled with sad stories and hopefully turn that around. Well, let's see. <laughs> Ken Ra, Ai Weiwei, thank you very much.